So this morning, um, our, our sermon is entitled Amazing Kinship. And so I'm going to, with further ado, I'm going to get right onto it. Often, you know, often in church, we, we say words. We say words like, I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. You know, we tend to use words that almost are like cliche. We overuse words. And one of the words we're going to talk about today, and we sang about it. We sang about the Redeemer. We talk, we're going to talk about our God today, our Redeemer today. We're going to talk about what he did for us and what our responsibility is. That word Redeemer simply means that to pay for or to ransom someone. And the book of Leviticus, uh, especially t- chapter 25, my brother, you know, he uh, read it all, very nicely. It explains that the role of the redeemer was to redeem a destitute relative. The Hebrew word for the, the word redeemer or kinsman's redeemer is goel, G-O apostrophe E-L, and it means to redeem. So this morning, if you read Leviticus chapter 25, it talks about four roles of the redeemer, but today we're going to talk about just the two roles And before we go into that, I want us to close our eyes and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts so we can hear clearly from God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house this morning. Father, Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, and there is nothing we can do, Lord, to pay the price that was paid for us at Calvary. Father, Lord, I ask that you give me the words and you make your people to open their hearts and be receptive to what we're going to talk about today. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me to Leviticus 25. We're going to go to Leviticus 25, chapter 25. So if you have your Bibles, go with me right there. And if you're there, I'm going to start reading. If It says, if, and I'm reading from the NIV. It says, if one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. And after they have sold themselves, one of their relatives may redeem them. An uncle or a cousin or a blood relative in their clan may redeem them. So from our reading, we can see that the goel or the redeemer had two roles. One was to redeem property that was given up by a poor relative, and the second one was to redeem a relative who had been sold to slavery. Now, I know our country has a history of slavery, and we've long forgotten about that, and God has made us to move forward. But we have a modern-day slavery that we are very familiar with. You know, the Bible says that if you owe any kind of money, and I know that, and many of us know that, we have a mortgage to our home, we, you are a slave to the debt, to the, the, to the lender. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. You know, I wake up sometimes and I go to work and I know I don't want to do it, but I'm forced to do it because by taking that mortgage, and it's not, my house is not fully paid for, I have automatically become a slave to the, to the lender. But anyway... The, Bible, the, first, the second role says that a relative can redeem you, can pay your price. So can you imagine with me that one day you hear from a long-lost uncle that, you know, your, your, your house, saying your house is going into foreclosure, you've slipped up on a few payments, and you get a phone call saying, I'm going to pay off your house. You know, that is amazing. That takes off that heavy load off of you. That sets you free. That sets you free to do the things that you normally want, you wouldn't have time to do. And that's what our Lord and Redeemer did for us on Calvary. He set us free. He gives us peace, and he gives us a certain amount of joy. Because when you're stressed, the joy of the Lord can be in you. You can't do, you're not free to do the things that you really want to do. And you're not free to do the things that God has created you to do. But before we go to our story, I want us to go to another story in the Bible, the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth captures that story of the Redeemer. It's a beautiful love story. And turn with me to Ruth 1, verse 1. That's where we're going to start. Ruth 1, chapter 1. 
It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Uh Uh-oh. And why am I saying uh uh-oh? Well, the Old Testament is a long history of the is- Israel and the Moab country. They were enemies. They were not friendly countries. In fact, the Bible says for 18 years, the Moabites had been a thorn in the flesh of Israel. So this is not a place where an Israelite would have gone to, to seek refuge. And sometimes in life, we do desperate things in desperate situations. You know, and w- this morning, if you've, made a, if you've found yourself in a place where you intended not to be. I have good news for you. God can redeem you. And God can take our, our, our mistakes. He can take our messes and turn them into a wonderful story. Stay with me. Verse 2 says, the, the man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malo and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Verse 3. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Oprah and another named Ruth. And after they lived there for about ten years, both Mallow and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons. So now we find Naomi going back to the land of Israel. Back to the land of Israel, she went back, but not only did she go back destitute, but she went back with a pagan woman. You know, God brought her back, and she had lost everything. She had lost everything that she went with. Can you imagine that when she left Moab? She had a husband. She had, two, she had two sons, and everything was going well. But when she came back, by the time she came back, she had lost everything. You know, there's some things in our lives that we have control over. But they're control over, and I'm talking about if you're deciding to eat healthy and be healthy, we have control over that. We have control over when to get out of bed. We have control over what color we want to paint our walls. There's a lot of things that we have control over. But then there's those things that we don't have control over. You know, Naomi could not control the de- You know, she didn't, have, she didn't know when her husband and sons were dying. She found herself in a situation that she totally had no control over. And one of these days as Christians, we are going to find ourselves in a, in a place where we don't have control over. How many of us know that Jesus is coming? Amen. And how many of us know the Bible says he's coming very soon? It says his coming is imminent. It's very soon. But how many of us know that the Bible says he's coming as a thief in the night? Now, when, the Bible, when it was written like that, it says if, if he comes as a thief in the night to you, you're lost. You see, that verse is talking to us Christians. It's not addressing the world. It's talking to us. Now, if we're not doing the things that Jesus wants us to do on a daily basis, if we're not sitting by his feet and learning from him on a day-to-daily basis, we're going to find ourselves lost on that day. So what is Jesus saying to us? He's saying, come to me. Learn from me. Let me teach you. Let me guide you. I know the way. I know how this is going to end. But you don't have the ability in of yourself to sustain it. How many of us wake up each morning and say, I'm, I know today I'm going to do what God wants me to do, and by noon you're falling flat on your faces? Exactly. What's going to sustain us is the Holy Spirit. And God cannot give us the Holy Spirit if we're not abiding in him. The Bible says that his children are the ones that are filled by the Holy Spirit, who are directed by the Holy Spirit, who walk by the Holy Spirit. So back to the story of Ruth. So now uh, Ruth and Naomi are now back in Israel. But the problem is, Naomi is, Ruth is a pagan woman. She does not know anything about God. 
In fact, when they left uh, Moab, she had just begun to know the things of God. And she had heard, the Bible doesn't completely you know, tell the whole story, but I can imagine in their home, they had been talking about the Lord. And, and you know what? It, it reminds me that when we're among people that don't believe, we need to talk about our God, because that's the only way they're going to know. You know, if we don't talk to our neighbors about God, to our co-workers about God, how will they know? We need to talk to people about God. So I can imagine Naomi was talking to Ruth about her God because by the time they were leaving Moab, she says, my God will be your God. My people will be her, your people. So she reaches Moab, but she's a pagan. And I can imagine in my own mind, I don't know of any Israelite men who would be rushing to marry her. You know, but God is faithful. If you've made a decision for God, God is going to lead you to the right person. So when Ruth accepted the Lord, when, so when, when Ruth was accepted by Boaz, and we all know the story, she met Boaz, she listened to Naomi, she met Boaz, and Boaz became her husband. So when Ruth accepted Boaz, her life and the life of her mother-in-law changed completely. In a culture that held genealogy in, in high regards, Naomi and Ruth had nothing in their future, but things were about to change. You see what happened? When Ruth married Boaz, she married to all his belongings. His belongings became her belongings, and, Ruth's fa and Naomi's family was completely restored. And that's what happens to us when we come to Jesus. First of all, when we come to Jesus, our lives are changed. But not only our lives, if you've come to Jesus and your life is the only life that has been changed, that needs to change. You know, the Bible says we're the salt of the earth. So we need to change and influence people around us, you know. We need to put our la a lampstand up here on the lampstand, not under the bed. Amen? Amen? So that's what happened when, Naomi's, when Ruth and Naomi's lives changed. It changed everybody's lives around us. So the story of Ruth is not different from our story, though. Like Ruth... And Naomi, Naomi uh, Boaz became his kinsman's redeemer and gave them hope. Jesus came to be our redeemer by dying in our place. But I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, we all know the story. Jesus died for us. But let's go to Genesis. Turn your Bibles to Genesis with me. We're going to, because I told, I don't know if I told you, but the story of redemption is closely knitted or linked to the story of redemption. It started way back in Genesis, and it's going to end in Revelation. But before it ends in Revelation, we're going to go back to be restored in Genesis. So go with me to Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over, the all, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God said what? And God said what? Let us make man in our image. Amen? Amen. Did he say let us make man in the image of angels? No. He said, let us make man in our image. Why? Because he knew that he was going to redeem us. He was going to become our kinsman's redeemer. You know, back in, back in the Levitical laws, if you didn't have a closest relative, every 50 years, God put in place the year of Jubilee. Yahweh himself will set you free. You see, once every 50 years, all debts were canceled. All property was returned to the, its original owner, and all slaves were, were set free. So w way back in the Garden of Eden, when he created us, Yahweh already became our redeemer. He knew what was going to happen. So stay with me. 
So back in the Garden of Eden, we know the story that Eve succumbed to the serpent. She, 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 she uh, listened to the devil's lies and disobeyed a direct command from God. See, what Eve didn't realize was when she listened to the lie, she enslaved the whole world. You know, we wonder sometimes why things happen the way they happen in this world. Well, we're enslaved. Hello, somebody. We're bought into sin. We're, we're in bondage. You know, but praise be to God that he has set us free. Amen? Amen. You know, so Eve probably didn't realize the extent of what she did. She had no clue. By disobeying one commandment, all humanity was derailed. And Adam, what about Adam? Well, when he agreed to eat that fruit, when he agreed to eat that fruit that his wife gave him, guess what happened? He, he handed over ownership of earth. The title deeds of earth were, were handed over to Satan. And it says so right here in the Bible, and you don't have to turn there, it says in John 14, 30, Jesus said that the prince of this world cometh, and he hath nothing on me. Folks, Satan is alive and well. He's roaming the earth. He is the prince of this world until Jesus comes and crushes his head forever. So back to our theme, though, you know, talking about the responsibilities of the Redeemer, the two roles of the Redeemer. What did I say the, the roles were again? To redeem property and to redeem a slave. Well, we know 2,000 years ago on Calvary, we were redeemed, you know. But some of us still live like we are in bondage, right? Every day, we, we are in bondage to sin. And we need to come to Jesus and set us free. You see, he did the work already on Calvary. But some of us are enslaved even today. There are people addicted to substance abuse. We know people like that, don't we? Yeah. Uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about. We know people that are enslaved to pornography. We know people that are still in bondage today, but the work was already done at Calvary. We just need to allow Jesus to come in our lives and change us. And if we don't know those people, if we are those people, we need to come and kneel at the cross and be changed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So he redeemed us. But what about the earth? We lost, we lost ownership through Adam of this earth. Well, there's more good news coming. Hang with me. In Revelation 21, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth come. So there's good news. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And all the former things would have passed away. Now, isn't that hope? You know, if you're going through something today and things don't look just the way they should be, there is hope. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where there's not going to be any sin, any dying, any death, all those things that, are, that enslave us, that keep us in bondage today, all that is going to be done with. That's the work that our Lord and Jesus did for us at Calvary. You know, when I said at the beginning that we use this word, Redeemer, almost like cliche, almost like the words we talk about, God bless you and all those things we do. We don't stop to think the depth and the meaning of what God did for us. As Christians, we shouldn't be walking around all broken up, all moppy like, you know, we have been redeemed. We have joy. We have hope. But what do we do with that hope? That's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about our role as the redeemed. So what is our role? Is our role just coming to church every Sabbath and saying happy Sabbath to everybody and that's it, we go home, end of story? No, no. You see, we're very good at coming to the Lord. As Christians, we're very good at coming to the Lord and accepting the Lord, but we have a hard time just doing what it says in the Bible. And God wants us to move away from that, move on. Move on from just coming to sit on pews. Move on. The last command he gave us was go out into the world. Go out into the world and make disciples of 
other people, other nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we might not baptize, and that's okay. We might lead them to the pastor in our church who baptize, amen? amen? But how about talking to them and leading them to Christ? You know, every seat here should be filled with people coming to know the Lord. And, you know, I don't know what it's going to be, but when we get to heaven... We're going to be either ashamed or surprised. One of the two. I don't know. But we need to bring people into Christ. We need to bring people into the kingdom of God. We need to talk to our neighbors. You know, when we first became Seventh-day Adventists, we, my husband had a co-worker. And I'm not condemning anybody, but I'm just trying to illustrate the point of what I'm making, that he worked with a with a Seventh-day Adventist um, co-worker that never told him about the Lord, not even one day. So when we converted and we went to the same church that she did, we were surprised. We're like, you knew this and you didn't tell us? How's that possible? You see, when people come to the Lord and when people want to know the Lord, they have a certain amount of hunger about them. But the church folk, us folks, we've become complacent. We've become too comfortable. We take what we know for granted. And we don't talk to anybody about the Lord no more. In fact, sometimes, if we're real honest, we get embarrassed to talk about the things of the Lord. But God doesn't want us to be that, that kind of people. He says he's coming back. He's coming back for a bride with no sport or wrinkle. He's coming to take a church that's been ready, that's been preparing you know, and, and don't get fooled by, you know, the word that says, you know, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, oh, I've heard it for a long time, when is he coming? You know, we can, that can fool us in a way. You know, when I first came to the Lord and began to read the Lord, I was, I want to say I was about 12 years old. And when I heard that the Lord was coming, it impacted me in a way it never did. In fact, that night I had a dream that the Lord was coming. I grew up in Africa where we have uh, people working in the yard. You know, they live with you, they work in your yard, they clean your house and all that. So in my dream, I was sitting in front of my house and I looked up and lo and behold, the Lord was coming. I was talking, I was excited. There was, you know, just like it says in the Bible, he's coming on a cloud. And there I looked up and there was Jesus on the cloud, but by the time he came down, he was the, the guy that worked in my garden. <laughs> but it stayed with me. It stayed with me, but that was a long time ago. And as a child, it kind of made me feel sad because I said, oh, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have a chance to get married, to have babies and all that. See, that can make us think that the Lord is coming a long, it, it's, Lord's coming is in a long way. But the Bible says he's coming soon. And we need to get ready. We don't need to concern our time, ourselves with the time or, the, or when he's coming. We just need to get ready. He's coming for a ready church, for a prepare, prepared people that know how to bring people into the kingdom of God. So if that, one thing I, ha I leave with you this morning is get ready, get ready, get ready. Jesus wants you to get ready. Jesus wants you to talk to people. Jesus wants you to, to minister to people. So in closing, you know, if you're, you know, all the stories, how many of us know that everything in the Bible is written for us? It's written for us. All those stories we read in the Bible, they're for us. So if there's anybody here this morning that's drowning in the storms of life, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Or if you know the Lord and you just haven't been doing what the Lord is, has been asking you to do, we're going to pray too. That as you leave today, leave, you know, leave knowing that God wants you to do something, that you've been redeemed at a costly price. If you read the book of Revelation, it says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come with his robe dipped in blood. Folks, there was a tremendous Price paid for our freedom. It wasn't cheap and it wasn't easy, but he did it anyway. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to thank you, Lord, for the price 
that was paid at Calvary. We want to thank you, Lord, for the complete work that you did to set us free. Father, we were trapped in our sins, and it was yet while we were in our sins that you died for us. And Father, if we're not living right, if we're not doing things that don't bring you joy and that don't bring people to the kingdom of God, Father, I pray, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you change us, Lord. Make us your ambassadors, Lord. Get us ready, Lord, for the time that you're coming. Father, I thank you for the word that you've given us this morning. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.